و مجالس داشته باشند و اگر چنان چه من کردند اونها بریزند در خیابانها و تظاهر کنند تا چه بشه. The Imam's presence in Paris made it possible for many journalists to meet and have interviews with him. These interviews made them more sensitive to the internal issues of Iran and more reports were made about people's fight against the Shah. As the Imam asked people to rally peacefully on the 9th and 10th of Muharram, known as Tasu'a and Ashura respectively, in 1979, many journalists came to Iran to cover the event. This rally was later called the Great Referendum of Iranians. A few days later, Sadiq Tambotambayi showed the photos of this rally to the Imam. Imam had not seen any photos of the rally himself. It was only related to him that the rally was like this or like that. It was crowded and uh, so on and so forth. But Imam had not seen the images himself, something like a clergyman with clenched fists in the front row. Up to a few years ago, they said such a clergyman is political. Imam always warned that they must, we must form a government. He said they have to be political. The prophet was a politician. Now you see how clergymen and the clerics entered the scene and how they came to actually run the stage. In some moments you see the image of Imam. It shows how happy Imam was. In the photo that you mentioned I am translating Mr. Shorlato's words for Imam. That clergymen are in the front row. The most interesting point is that religious and non-religious politicians stood, stood actually by Imam in the political stage. This is the excerpt of that news analysis. And this rally showed that the Shah did not have any place in Iran anymore. The monarchy was already over in Iran. January 16th, 1979, Iranian newspapers used their largest fonts to break the news that the Shah left. People saw the victory nearby and believed that they could achieve great goals with empty hands. The countdown for the victory had already started. It was now time for the Imam to double the joy of the victory. As far as I remember, we were supposed to return to Iran on January 26th. It was January 21st or 26th when they said we were going to Iran. We said, oh my God, the Shah's people are still running the country. What will happen if we go? 
We were all worried for the imam. Actually, no one thought about himself really. Everybody was willing to sacrifice himself for the imam and his noble cause. I can tell you with certainty that the night we were coming to Iran, everybody was against it, except Imam himself. The atmosphere in Nufal Chateau was kind of strange, filled with fear and joy. The Imam wanted to return to Iran. The news spread so fast. Bakhtiar, the then Prime Minister, ordered the shutdown of the airports. The Imam's flight was delayed for a week. Meanwhile, People took to the streets and urged Bakhtiar to open the airports. Finally, airports opened up and the trip was scheduled. The Imam, accompanied by 120 journalists, was supposed to fly by an Air France aeroplane from Paris to Tehran. The Imam packed up on January 31st and bid farewell to the people of Nufla Chateau. He gathered all the people who had contributed in one way or another in the past few months to thank them. It was about two hours prior to heading to Paris when Dr. Yazdi asked us to go see Imam. We went to Imam's place with that group. I have the picture with me. Well, Imam talked a little about what we had done and actually thanked us. Then he said, I don't want you to have any obligation to come along. This trip can be really dangerous. I wouldn't like any of you to be harmed. If you don't want to come along, it's okay, then stay. But then everybody agreed to join and come along. Then Imam said, now that you like to join me and accompany me, then be it. On that day, the route from Mehrabad Airport to Azadi Square and Azadi Street witnessed one of its happiest and most crowded days. People had come to the streets in the early morning and counted the moments to see the Imam. The Imam's pictures were everywhere. Banners welcoming Imam were here and there. And everybody wanted to have a share in this huge welcoming ceremony. Streets were cleaned up and covered with flowers people were eagerly waiting for Imam. Many had come early to find a suitable place so that they could take a glimpse at the Imam. The people themselves took the responsibility for the order and security of the rally. Many people had been selected to secure the rally and all had bands on their arms. They did their very best to hold a perfect welcoming ceremony for the Imam. The huge number of people who filled the streets changed all the previous predictions and plans. The Imam had announced that he would have his first speech in the cemetery where the martyrs of the revolution lay. The welcoming committee had set up a stage in that place. On the morning of February 1st, 1979, the people had gathered around the stage and counted the seconds to see their Imam. They wanted to hear and see the first lecture of Imam 
in Behisht -e Zahra Cemetery after 14 years of exile. They were difficult moments, and nobody knew the reaction of the government. Would the Imam be arrested? Or would he get off the plane safely? Finally, the airplane carrying Imam landed at 9.35 in the morning in Mehrabad airport, and after a few minutes, the Imam got off the plane. He entered the arrival lounge accompanied by people and left the airport for Behisht -e Zahra Cemetery. The car Imam was in disappeared in the crowd and then reappeared. It couldn't open its way to the cemetery. People had blocked its way because they wanted to see the Imam for themselves. The car stopped and the welcoming authorities could hardly take the Imam to another car. And then to the helicopter they had arranged for. The helicopter took the Imam to Behisht -e Zahra Cemetery. The helicopter landed near the graves of martyrs of the revolution. Security officials took the Imam to the stage. The Imam went to the stage and people started chanting Allahu Akbar, meaning God is great. The ceremony began. The Imam turned to the graves of the martyrs and began his historic address by extending his condolences to the martyrs' families. He called the Shah's regime illegal and promised people to establish a new government. مصیبت های بسیار بزرگ و بعض پیروزی ها حاصل شد که البته اون هم بزرگ بود خب ما حساب بکنیم که این مصیبت ها برای چه به این ملت وارد شد مگر این ملت چه می گفت و چه می گوید که از اون وقتی که صدای ملت در آمده است تا حالا قتل و ظلم و غارت و همه اینها ادامه دارد ملت ما چه می گفتند که مستحق به این عقوبات شدن ملت ما یک مطلبش این بود که این سلطنت پهلوی از اول که پای گذاری شد برخلاف قوانین بود بنابراین سلطنت محمد رضا اولا که چون سلطنت پدرش قاطع قا... چیز بود خلاف قانون بود و با زور و با سرنیزه تحسیز شده بود مجلس غیر قانونی است پس من سلطنت محمد رضا هم غیر قانونی است من از شما مردم تهران سوال می کنم که آیا این وکلایی که در مجلس هستند که در مجلس سنا و که در مجلس شورا شما اطلاع داشتید که اینا را خودتون تعیین کنید اکثر این مردم می این افرادی را که به عنوان مجلس و به عنوان وکیل مجلس سنا یا مجلس شورا در مجلس هستند یا این هم با زور تعیین شده بدون اطلاع مردم مجلسی که بدون اطلاع مردم است و بدون رضایت مردم است این مجلس مجلس غیر قانونی است و اما دولتی که ناشی می شد از یک شایی که خودش و پدرش غیر قانونی است خودش علاوه بر او غیر قانونی است وکلایی که تعیین کرده است غیر قانونی است مجلس دولتی که از همچه مجلسی و همچه سلطانی انشا بشد این دولت غیر قانونی است ممکن که خود اون آدم دولت اون آدم مجلس اون آدم تمام اینها غیر قانونی است 
و اگر ادامه به این بدن اینها مجرمند و باید محاکمه بشن و ما اونها را محاکمه میکنیم من دولت تعیین میکنم من تو دهن این دولت میزنم من دولت تعیین میکنم من به فشتبانی این ملت دولت تعیین میکنم من به واسطه این که ملت من را قبول دارد Ten days after this lecture, the revolution gained victory. The Imam ordered Mr. Bazargan to create an interim government. One of the first orders of Imam was holding a referendum. in which people were supposed to decide for the Islamic Republic. Mr. Mehdi Bazarkan, based on the recommendation of the Revolutionary Council and the religious and legal rights attributed to the consensus reached by the nation of Iran through huge gatherings and extensive rallies in all over Iran toward the leader of the movement and um, because I trust in your firm belief in the holy religion of Islam and that I am aware of your background in Islamic and national protests. I, uh, without considering partisan relationships and your political affinity, assign you to form the interim government. Uh, in order to manage the affairs of the country and especially holding a referendum about changing the political system of the country to Islamic Republic and uh, forming the founding committee of people's representatives to ratify the constitution um, of the new government and uh, the election of people's representatives uh, based on the new constitution. I went to home to see Imam. It was mid-March. I told Imam that preparations were made as he ordered, and God willing, we can have a referendum by the end of June, August, or even September. He asked, what? No way! This Noru's holiday, you must hold the referendum. I said, you mean in these 10 to 12 days? He said, yes, exactly. I then immediately said, but there were several obstacles. Firstly, some people in the universities and political parties say that it's not a democratic way to ask only one question from the people and give them only one choice. There are people who do not want monarchy, but uh, don't want an Islamic Republic system either. You are asking people to say yes or no to the Islamic Republic, basically. People have the choice of the former kingdom and monarchy, that is, in their mind. lingering on still or that of the new Islamic Republic system. Now, if they don't want that or this one, it might create some problems later on. Imam then asked us what to do. I said my opinion and that there are two segments on this paper, yes and no. I recommended that people who want another governance system write it down on the back of the ballot sheet. We said this as the basis. March 30th was chosen for the referendum. And the referendum was held on that very date, that is March 30th. The Imam was in Qom in those days, and on the early morning of March the 30th, came here, to the Char Mardan district, to take part in the referendum. The Imam's car arrived 
and people rushed to see him. People surrounded Imam's car and security forces couldn't hold them back. Finally, Imam had to cast his vote from inside the car. و جمهوری اسلامی از دست دادند و برای اینکه اونها را شاد و ملت اسلام را دلگرم کنم به جمهوری اسلامی رأی دادم من امیدوارم که همه ملت اسلام همه ملت ایران موفق باشند و ملت ما رأی به and about two or three in the afternoon of the following day, except for a few large cities like Tehran and Mashhad, the result of most cities was sent to the Ministry of Interior. At about 10.30 or 11 p.m., we had the final results, and I went to Qom with a report to tell Imam how things have developed. It was about 1.30 or 2 in the morning when I reached my sister's home and told Mr. Ahmad I uh, need to speak to Imam and I want to report report uh, the status to him. He said, well, uh, leave it for tomorrow. I said, but I have to return to Tehran early morning tomorrow. He said, then let's wait until Imam gets up for, for midnight prayers, and then we can meet him after he's uh, said his morning prayers. We, well, waited and met Imam then, and I congratulated him. This phenomenon was unique in the history of our country, and will never truly happen again. This turnout figure and this voting process. Despite all the obstacles and challenges out of the eligible voters being a little more than 94 percent of the population actually attended the election process. That was about 98 percent that voted yes. However, about 315 or 16 people and in instances wrote a different governance system, the People's Democratic Republic. After people's vote for the Islamic Republic, the constitution was written and then put to vote. Then, parliamentary and presidential elections took place with a huge turnout to realize the slogan of neither East nor West, just the Islamic Republic. In those days, the Imam came from Qom to Tehran and rented a house in Jamaran in north of Tehran to live in. The house was next to a Husseiniye, or a small mosque, where people met the Imam until the last days of his life. مسائلی بود که هیچ اراده ما درش دخالت نداشت. هر چی بود و تا حالا هر چی است. و از اول هر چی بود با اراده خدا بود. من هیچ برای خودم یه چیزی که عملی خودم کرده باشم یه چیزی برای خودم قائل باشم نیستم برای شما هم قائل نیست هر چه هست از دوست For centuries, fishing was done in an environmentally friendly way. Less fish were extracted from the water than those that could reproduce. In order to avoid epidemics from doing away with a crop of fish, the results are the breeding of lower quality fish and permanent damage to the coast. An uncontrolled increase in their capture could endanger the survival of whales, seals, and other animals that 